October 16, 1984, four-year-old Gregory Villemin was playing outside in his garden in Le Pange sur Vologne in northeastern France. His mother, Christine, was occupied with household chores. When it was time for Gregory to come inside, his mother went out to call him in, only to find that he was nowhere to be seen. The case has remained a mystery for over 30 years, with over 3,000 newspaper articles, 50 academic theses, and 15 books dedicated to uncovering the truth. The disappearance of Gregory Villemin has captured the attention of the media, leaving many wondering who was involved and why. Nestled in the picturesque northeastern part of France, in the Vosges part of the Lorraine region, lies the charming village of Lepange sur Vologne. Surrounded by rolling hills and bordered by the enchanting landscapes of Germany, this village is a true gem known for its breathtaking natural beauty. The local economy thrives on agriculture and forestry, with vast forests providing resources for the local sawmills and paper mills. The fertile lands yield bountiful crops of wheat, corn and potatoes from the numerous farms in the area, offering employment opportunities to the villagers. It is in this serene setting that the esteemed Villemin family made their home, marking the beginning of our captivating tale. In a town where whispers spread like wildfire, the Villemin family, with its extensive network of relatives, found themselves at the center of a chilling mystery. Little did they know that their peaceful existence would be shattered by the arrival of an enigmatic figure known only as the Raven. From the late 70s to the early 80s, this mysterious figure unleashed a campaign of terror upon the family, delivering ominous messages and sinister threats that plunged them into a nightmare. What began as a series of disturbing phone calls soon escalated into a full-blown ordeal, leaving the family grappling with the repercussions of the raven's actions. As suspicion and fear gripped the once harmonious community, the Villemin family found themselves thrust into a harrowing ordeal that would forever alter their lives. The legacy of the raven and the events of 1984 would cast a long shadow over the family, haunting them for years to come. The name itself, inspired by a renowned French film, would come to symbolize the dark chapter that unfolded in the heart of Le Pange sur Vologne. The name was based on a famous French movie about a woman who discovers that her husband is cheating on her. Outraged by the betrayal of their husbands, she took matters into her own hands, orchestrating a sophisticated scheme to expose the infidelity rampant in their small village. Anonymously, she sent meticulously crafted letters to each wife, signed with the ominous moniker, The Raven. This fictional character soon became synonymous with the act of revealing secrets through anonymous correspondence in France. However, the tale took a dark turn when the enigmatic Raven targeted the Villemin family, unleashing a wave of unsettling phone calls and letters upon them. The caller's tactics ranged from eerie whispers to chilling death threats, leaving the family in a state of constant fear. Despite the relentless torment, it was clear that the 26-year-old Jean-Marie was not the elusive raven. As a successful factory supervisor known as the Little Boss Man, Jean-Marie had garnered both admiration and resentment from his peers. This animosity towards him was mirrored by the mysterious caller who made their disdain for him known through their menacing messages. The Villemin family, perplexed by the caller's fixation on Jean-Marie, struggled to uncover the true identity behind the raven. The primary target of the caller's harassment, Jean-Marie's success and recent marriage to the elegant Christine, only fueled the caller's hatred. Their union, marked by envy and admiration, resulted in the birth of Gregory Villemin in 1980. Despite their outward appearance of happiness, the couple's lives were marred by the constant threat of the raven's presence. As Gregory grew older, he witnessed the toll that the caller's actions took on his parents, referring to the mysterious tormentor as Mr. Man. In a bid for peace, the family relocated to a serene house on the outskirts of town in 1983, hoping to escape the clutches of the raven, but that wasn't the end. 
The individual who made the calls became increasingly fixated on Jean-Marie's success and began making threats against Christine. He would call Jean-Marie at his workplace and describe in detail the dangers he had set up for Christine. Despite the pressure from the Raven, Jean-Marie tried to remain resolute and not give in to the threats. The caller persisted, questioning Jean-Marie about his reaction if he were to set their home on fire. Despite feeling anxious, Jean-Marie refused to show fear or comply with the demands. In frustration, the Raven escalated the situation by threatening harm to their three-year-old son, Gregory. The Raven cautioned Jean-Marie against allowing their son to play outside after school, warning of potential kidnapping. Jean-Marie, a devoted father, was outraged by the threat and warned the caller that he would take drastic action if his son was harmed. The Raven realized he had reached Jean-Marie's breaking point. Subsequently, the caller vanished for a year and a half, during which time there were no further communications with the Villemain family. It is possible that the family had informed the authorities and begun recording the calls, but this did not deter the Raven, who resorted to sending menacing letters instead. These letters not only contained vile threats, but also made direct references to Jean-Marie, who oversaw a group of twenty men. The contents of the letters were disturbing, with one promising to flay the family alive and others threatening to desecrate their graves. By 1984, there had been a year and a half of silence without any suspicious threats or hostile actions. The family believed that the Raven had disappeared for good. However, on October 16, 1984, Christine, Gregory's mother, picked up Gregory from daycare after work. Upon returning home, she played music while Gregory went outside to play in the front yard. When it was time for Gregory to come inside around 5 p.m., she discovered that he was missing. Christine was filled with anxiety, yet she remained somewhat composed as the Raven had been absent for a year and a half. She set out to search for Gregory, visiting the homes of his friends, but no one had any information on his whereabouts. Upon returning home, she received a call from her mother-in-law, who delivered the chilling news that the Raven had taken her son. The mother-in-law recounted how Michel, Jean's brother, had been informed by the Raven that Gregory's body had been disposed of in a nearby river. Christine immediately contacted the authorities, prompting a swift search for her missing son. Sadly, just a few hours after he went missing, at 9 p.m., Gregory's lifeless body was discovered floating in the river. Despite the tragic circumstances, he appeared peaceful, with his little hat covering his face and his arms bound in a peculiar manner. The police retrieved his body, revealing the heartbreaking reality of a young child's life cut short. As the investigation into the death of little Gregory progressed, the authorities interviewed numerous individuals in the vicinity. One individual came forward with an insulin needle they had discovered near the nearby river. Initially, the police suspected that a member of the Villemain family was behind Gregory's tragic demise, as they believed the perpetrator must have possessed intimate knowledge of the family's daily routines and habits. The case garnered widespread media attention, prompting journalists from all over France to journey to the small town in hopes of assisting in unraveling the mystery. Subsequently, on October 17, 1984, a letter was delivered to Jean-Marie and Christine's residence. The letter, postmarked from within the village on the day of Gregory's murder, contained a disturbing message. Hey boss, I hope you're satisfied now. Money cannot bring back your son. This is my act of vengeance. The writer addressed Jean-Marie as Boss, a moniker bestowed upon him due to being the sole family member to transcend the working class. Furthermore, the letter hinted at the writer harboring animosity towards multiple family members. Following the receipt of the letter, Gregory's funeral took place. On October 19, 1984, the entire family and town attended, alongside all the law enforcement officers, in hopes of scrutinizing the guests' expressions for any signs of suspicious behavior. Numerous French journalists were also present at the funeral, turning it into a major spectacle. They sought to capture images and footage of the purported event. Throughout the funeral, 
the police were specifically on the lookout for individuals who displayed a lack of emotion or erratic conduct. Meanwhile, the press was preoccupied with taking photographs and videos. Despite Christine's heart-rending wails during the burial, the journalists persisted in their documentation. They captured numerous images and videos of the funeral, including Christine being carried away due to her inability to stand. Despite the diligent efforts of the police, the funeral did not provide any fresh leads in the investigation. Instead, it merely supplied additional material for the sensationalist journalists. The authorities proceeded with bringing in the remaining members of the village family for questioning. They opted to utilize a technique inspired by the Raven movie mentioned earlier, instructing all family members to write the same letter with both their right and left hands. Following this, the authorities informed the family that they would follow up once they had analyzed the handwriting. In addition to this, they interviewed distant relatives and family friends who had received calls resembling a woman's voice, leading the authorities to contemplate the possibility of multiple suspects. This raven figure could potentially be a woman, a duo consisting of a man and a woman, or simply an individual imitating these voices. The authorities were now faced with the task of scrutinizing all the handwriting samples they had collected, along with the new information regarding the potential involvement of a woman in the crime. While experts analyzed the handwriting samples, the authorities pondered over the fact that the raven had vanished for a year and a half. They questioned whether there had been a triggering event that caused the raven to resurface in anger, as they were puzzled by the sudden silence. The only lead they had was that Jean-Marie's brother, Michel, had recently visited with his wife at Jean and Christine's residence. Michel harbored jealousy towards his brother's accomplishments and struggled to maintain steady employment. Just two days before little Gregory went missing, he had been invited to the Villemain household and shown the new house extension, leather couch, and car. The authorities speculated that Michel's envy may have driven him to hide, plan, and carry out Gregory's murder. As Michel was being interrogated, the handwriting experts arrived at the door with a surprising revelation. They had identified a match in the handwriting, belonging to a cousin named Bernard Laroche, not Michel. This unexpected turn of events left everyone stunned, and the authorities now had a new suspect in their sights. However, they were left wondering about Bernard's motives and background. Bernard Laroche, Jean-Marie's cousin from his mother's side, was left orphaned at a tender age and found solace living with his close-knit family of brothers, Jean and Michel. His bond with Michel was so strong that they were more like brothers than cousins. However, when Jean-Marie tied the knot with Christine, tensions arose between Bernard and Jean-Marie. Bernard harbored a strong dislike for Christine, often criticizing her as arrogant, annoying, snobbish, and stuck up. Jean-Marie staunchly defended his wife, insisting that Christine was simply misunderstood. This led to frequent clashes between the two. The police confronted Bernard Laroche with evidence that his handwriting matched that of the Raven's letters, demanding an explanation. Bernard claimed to have an alibi for that day, stating that he was with his sister-in-law, who was married to Bernard's brother and had no connection to the Villemain family. Bernard insisted that he had been in her company the entire time and that it was impossible for him to have been at the river. The authorities then notified Bernard that they would be interrogating his sister-in-law to confirm his alibi. Subsequently, the investigators brought in Bernard Laroche's sister-in-law, the 15-year-old Muriel, who asserted that she had been with him on the day of Gregory's disappearance. She assured the police that Bernard was speaking the truth. However, as the interrogation progressed, a shocking revelation surfaced, adding layers of complexity to the investigation. Muriel eventually confessed to fabricating her initial story and disclosed that they had not remained at home as she had previously stated. Instead, Bernard had fetched her from school and they visited a stranger's residence. It was there that Bernard took a four-year-old child and they drove to a nearby river. Bernard exited the vehicle with the child and returned alone. At the time, Muriel did not think much of the situation. She came clean about everything. 
Finally, after numerous days, the authorities obtained a genuine confession and the strategy of analyzing handwriting proved effective. The police informed the judge about Muriel's admission, emphasizing that they required the judge's authorization to detain Bernard. Consequently, the police had to secure an arrest warrant from the presiding judge, Judge Lambert, based on Muriel's confession. However, upon approaching him, he declined to hear her testimony due to the upcoming weekend. This decision was unprecedented for a judge, particularly in a case that had garnered national interest. Instead, he proposed that they release Muriel to Bernard's custody and instruct her not to disclose anything until Monday. Following the judge's guidance, the police sent Muriel home with Bernard. This course of action was unexpected, as Muriel could have easily divulged her confession to Bernard, prompting him to flee or worse, leading to a change in Muriel's statement. Upon revisiting the police on Monday, Muriel stood by her initial statement without wavering, despite the potential for external influences. She reiterated her account to Judge Lambert, solidifying Bernard LaRoche as Gregory's killer. Following this, Muriel's identity was carelessly disclosed by Judge Lambert on television, sparking outrage in the village. The aftermath saw Muriel facing scrutiny and accusations of being physically assaulted by her own family for her role in Bernard's arrest. However, a week later, Muriel recanted her confession on TV, alleging coercion and threats by the police. Consequently, Bernard Laroche was released due to lack of evidence, including the dismissal of handwriting analysis tainted by irregularities. The situation escalated when Gregory's father, Jean-Marie, publicly expressed his intent to take matters into his own hands if justice was not served, hinting at potential violence ahead. At this stage, the media had significantly influenced the narrative surrounding this murder, which was quickly evolving into a scandal. Judge Lambert's decision to disclose Muriel's name on television, followed by Muriel's appearance claiming mistreatment by the police, and Jean-Marie's televised vow to take matters into his own hands by killing Bernard, had all contributed to the situation spiraling out of control. The media's involvement had led to a proliferation of misinformation with uncertainties surrounding the alleged threats made by the police towards Muriel. While she asserted that they threatened to send her to a reformatory, the veracity of her claims remained in question. Moreover, there were speculations that family members had coerced her into retracting her confession after the judge's revelation. Amidst these developments, four unexpected witnesses emerged, alleging to have seen Christine, Gregory's mother, at the post office on the day of the murder, a detail she had not disclosed to the authorities. This revelation prompted the police to scrutinize Christine's involvement in her son's tragic demise. Despite Christine's assertion that she had visited the post office on Monday, October 15, 1984, the day prior to Gregory's disappearance, the absence of a postmarked date on the receipt she had sent raised doubts about the timeline. Consequently, the police began to focus their inquiries on Christine, suspecting that the individual who had posted the letter might be linked to Gregory's murder. The journalists covering the murder case of Gregory Villemain were split into two factions, those who suspected Christine's involvement and those who did not. Judge Lambert relished the spotlight the case attracted from the national media of France. He made a point to pose for photographs and even requested journalists to capture him in candid moments, such as shopping at a market. All of this was captured on an audio recording that would later be made public. As these images made their way into newspapers, Judge Lambert found himself torn between convicting Bernard or Christine. Regardless of his decision, he lacked concrete evidence against either of them. Rumors circulated among journalists that Lambert harbored feelings for Christine due to her striking beauty and charm. She appeared ageless and bewitching, captivating all who laid eyes on her. Consequently, Christine swiftly became France's most reviled woman. If she were found guilty and imprisoned, she would be deemed the worst of mothers. Conversely, if she were acquitted, it would be attributed to the judge's affection for her. This narrative was relentlessly perpetuated by the media. Amidst the chaos, Christine and Jean-Marie opted to sell their home and attempt to conceive once more. 
they struggled to cope with the press harassment and the loss of their young son. Encouraged by loved ones, they embarked on the journey of welcoming another child into their lives, hoping it would provide them with solace. In 1985, Christine and Jean-Marie welcomed a set of twins. Despite this joyous occasion, the media continued to vilify Christine, with even a police officer criticizing her attire as too provocative for a grieving woman. When news of Christine's pregnancy broke and her baby bump became visible, accusations arose that she was exploiting her condition to evade punishment and garner sympathy. The authorities summoned her once more for interrogation, honing in on the baseless allegations of infidelity and the paternity of Jean-Marie's child, Gregory. They requested her to undergo a handwriting examination and replicate the Raven's letters using both her right and left hand, a task she completed before heading back home. Christine and Jean-Marie anxiously awaited the outcome of the handwriting analysis. With no incriminating evidence against Christine, these tests would serve as confirmation that she was innocent of any involvement in Gregory's tragic demise, allowing the couple to finally shift their focus back to their lives. However, a few weeks later, on March 25, 1985, the media reported that the judge had verified the match of Christine's handwriting. This news shattered the mother, leading her to stop eating, suffer a breakdown, and require hospitalization. During this period, she tragically lost one of her twins due to the stress induced by the judge's actions. The judge delivered the devastating news that she would be arrested and tried for her own son's murder. Jean-Marie longed to bring his wife back home, but she remained hospitalized. He aimlessly roamed the streets, overwhelmed by a sense of helplessness and loss. On March 29, 1985, Jean visited Gregory's gravesite, where he claimed to hear his departed son communicating with him. Consumed by anger and despair, Jean drove to Bernard Laroche's residence and fatally shot him in front of his family with a shotgun. Overwhelmed with regret, he rushed to the clinic to confess to Christine and seek forgiveness for his actions. Subsequently, he surrendered himself to the authorities. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to five years in prison, with credit for time served awaiting trial and a partial suspension of the sentence. Jean was released in December 1987, having served two and a half years behind bars. Meanwhile, the media frenzy surrounding the shocking sequence of events reached a fever pitch. Christine, pregnant and now without Jean, was left to confront the aftermath on her own. Following the shooting incident, Christine was discharged from the hospital but faced severe backlash from the press. Christine has faced accusations of witchcraft and poor motherhood, yet she has maintained her grace under the harsh spotlight of public judgment. Despite her efforts to remain composed, she has been unfairly branded as aloof and uncaring. Adding to the turmoil, gossip has emerged suggesting she eloped with another man just before her marriage to Jean-Marie. There are whispers that she never desired marriage, motherhood, or the burden of a son. Even Judge Lambert has spread a scandalous tale of Jean-Marie allegedly striking her for overcooking steaks he had brought home. While the story seemed implausible, the judge shared it with the press, intensifying the public's condemnation of Christine. The media has portrayed her as increasingly bitter, especially towards mothers who endure abuse or feel constrained by their children. As a result, headlines now depict her as a malevolent witch who sacrificed her own child. The magistrate made the decision to detain Christine due to the escalating public outcry. At the time, she was six months pregnant and had been separated from her husband. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, Christine was accused of Gregory's murder in July 1985. She embarked on an 11-day hunger strike in protest, with Jean-Marie following suit. Following an appeals court ruling that highlighted the weak evidence and absence of a clear motive, Christine was released. Two months later, she gave birth to her son and was paid by journalists for photographs of her cradling him. Christine agreed to this arrangement as she and Jean-Marie had lost their home and needed to cover legal expenses. 
Despite the family's financial struggles, the images were later used in a malicious article insinuating that she would harm her next child. It was intriguing to discover that the same trio of journalists were writing under various aliases for numerous media outlets, creating the illusion that Christine was universally despised when, in reality, it was only those three individuals. Christine's health deteriorated later that year, leading to an overdose on tranquilizers and a hospitalization, fortunately without fatal consequences. In 1987, the presiding judge, Judge Lambert, was removed from the case upon revelations of his baseless arrest of Christine and involvement in underhanded dealings. He had been orchestrating meetings with journalists at the market to spread unfounded rumors and accusations against Christine. A new judge took over, conducting a comprehensive re-evaluation of the case. During his year-long hiatus, Judge Lambert penned a book on the case, portraying Christine as a captivating yet manipulative and malevolent figure causing public confusion. However, the new judge refused to be swayed by his predecessor's biased views and conducted a thorough investigation. Ultimately, Christine and her son were granted a reprieve. The second judge opted to pursue the insulin trail in the Gregory Villemin case, as it was logical that the child appeared serene when discovered in the river. Upon scrutiny, it was revealed that the sole individual in the family with access to insulin prescriptions was Bernard LaRoche's mother-in-law, who suffered from diabetes. Nevertheless, the LaRoche were less than cooperative during interrogation. Subsequently, a cunning journalist managed to deceive the second judge into an interview, covertly recording the dialogue. In the recording, the second judge disclosed his belief that the LaRoche were culpable and that Bernard was the perpetrator. The journalist leaked the recording, resulting in the removal of the second judge from the case. Shortly after, he was discovered in a comatose state in his lodge following a heart attack. Following his coma, the second judge experienced amnesia and could not recollect the case of Christine and Gregory. A third judge was then appointed to oversee the case. After reviewing the second judge's work, the judge determined that there was insufficient evidence to incriminate Christine. Consequently, all charges against her were officially dismissed on February 2nd, 1993, and her innocence was publicly proclaimed. Despite this, none of the journalists who defamed Christine expressed regret for their actions. In 2000, authorities sought to examine the DNA, as all the letters from the Raven bore a licked stamp. However, when they endeavored to analyze the DNA, it was revealed that the letters had not been properly preserved as evidence, rendering the DNA nearly unusable. Despite the case garnering attention, there were no significant advancements, and the case went cold in 2001 after DNA testing on a stamp affixed to one of the Raven's letters yielded no fresh evidence. In 2004, three years following the final DNA examination, the Villemin were at last granted a sumptuous compensation of 35,000 euros by the court for the profound personal suffering they endured as a result of the mishandling of their son's case. The scrutiny of cameras, the time spent in confinement, the unjust accusations, such burdens were too heavy for any parent to bear. And let us not overlook the years of living in constant dread uncertain of when or where the enigmatic raven would strike next. Fast forward to 2008, and investigators found themselves once more meticulously examining the evidence. At the behest of the Vietnamese, they conducted additional tests to search for DNA on Gregory's restraints and certain letters. Could this be the breakthrough they had been eagerly anticipating? Alas, all results turned out inconclusive, the perpetrator remained at large, taunting them, yet hope had not completely dissipated. Come April 2013, they resolved to analyze Gregory's garments and footwear next. Could this be the moment? Would they finally uncover the vital evidence required to bring closure to this case once and for all? The odds were stacked against them. If the culprit had left behind any DNA, the water likely had washed it away. Nevertheless, they persevered. It was imperative to provide the Villemin with some semblance of resolution, some peace of mind. The tension was palpable as they awaited the test results, 
and when they were eventually disclosed, it was yet another setback, inconclusive once more. The perpetrator remained at large, lurking in the shadows. The question lingered. Would they ever capture him? The murder case of Gregory Villemay remained unsolved until June 2017, when a ray of hope appeared with the introduction of a sophisticated software named Anacron. This software had the ability to identify discrepancies and suspicious statements, prompting the authorities to carefully review interviews with Villemain's relatives, ultimately leading them to Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob, the boy's great aunt and uncle. The evidence seemed to suggest that the raven was the result of collaboration between a man and a woman, raising suspicions that the couple could be involved. Furthermore, they had a possible motive, as they were believed to hold a grudge against Muriel Boll, a crucial witness in the case. Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob had taken care of Bernard Laroche after his mother's passing, making them resentful towards Muriel for her testimony, which ultimately led to Bernard's demise. The police were also delving into the reasons behind Muriel Boll, retracting her statement about Bernard and the alleged assault on her that prompted her to change her narrative in the media. As the investigation progressed, tensions escalated, and the suspects were finally interrogated. However, just when it appeared that a breakthrough was imminent, all three were released due to inconclusive findings from the questioning. This outcome left both law enforcement and the public disheartened, with no closer to uncovering the true culprit. The decision to reopen Gregory's case caused a stir within the local community, but it was the sudden and mysterious death of the initial judge, Judge Lambert, that truly sent shivers down everyone's spine. On July 11, 2017, Judge Lambert was discovered lifeless with a plastic bag over his head. Authorities stated that he had taken his own life by suffocation, but amidst mounting pressure from the renewed investigation, doubts began to surface regarding the official narrative. Judge Lambert's farewell letter to the local newspaper stirred up even more curiosity, alluding to hidden truths and controversies within the French legal system. He made it clear that he would not allow himself to be the scapegoat once more. Lambert, the very judge who had sent Muriel back to her home after she confessed that Bernard was the murderer, was also behind the witch theory that haunted Christine for years. In 2018, the Villeman case resurfaced when Muriel Boll, a key figure in the investigation, released a shocking book titled Breaking the Silence. In its pages, she accused the authorities of coercing a false confession from her and stood by her cousin Bernard's innocence in Gregory's murder case. She vehemently denied the cousin's claim that she had been pressured into retracting her statement. However, Muriel's explosive accusations did not sit well with her own family, leading to a complaint being filed against her by the offended cousin. Subsequently, Muriel was charged with aggravated defamation in 2019. Despite the Villeman family's relentless pursuit of truth over the years, a glimmer of hope emerged in December 2020 when French media disclosed that a Swiss firm's analysis of the threatening letters had identified a single suspect. It appeared that justice was finally within reach. Yet, in a cruel twist of fate, the suspect's identity remained undisclosed, plunging the family back into the abyss of uncertainty and anguish. As the new year began, the Villemans persisted in their quest for justice. In January 2021, an appeals court in Dijon granted their plea to compare DNA samples from the evidence with those of their extended family. However, with each passing day and no concrete answers in sight, the family's aspirations for closure dwindled. The Villemain family's ordeal serves as a poignant illustration of the heartless and irrational aspects of crime. Despite their unwavering determination, the family continues to struggle in their search for the solace and closure they yearn for. Instead, they are burdened with a painful emptiness, constantly tormented by the enigma surrounding the fate of their dear little Gregory. The mystery of his tragic death still lingers, unresolved. The Villemain family remains in the dark about the identity of Gregory's killer. In the city of San Antonio, known for its vibrant culture and historical landmarks, 
a dark incident unfolded on June 3, 1981. A young girl mysteriously disappeared, leaving the community in shock and concern. The following day, a tragic discovery was made in Comal County, Texas. A lifeless body bearing the signs of a violent crime was found. The victim had been shot multiple times in the head, and her clothes had been torn and removed. For twenty-seven long years, the identity of this unfortunate soul remained a perplexing mystery. The case persisted, spanning four decades, until it finally reached its climactic resolution in 2023. One may wonder, what caused such a prolonged delay in solving this case? Why was the victim not identified for such an extensive period of time? San Antonio, being the seventh most populous city in the United States and the twelfth most populous in North America, is a bustling metropolis with a rich colonial heritage. It attracts visitors from around the world, drawn to its iconic landmarks such as the Alamo, the Riverwalk, and the San Antonio Mission's National Historic Park. This city, known for its affordability and family-friendly environment, harbored a hidden darkness unbeknownst to many. During the 1970s and 80s, San Antonio became a focal point for numerous crimes, and this cold case became a part of the unfortunate series of events that plagued those times. On June 4, 1981, the partially clothed body of a young girl, estimated to be between 17 to 20 years old, was discovered south of New Braunfels, Texas. The location of the grim find was between the northbound access road and Interstate 35. Upon examination, it was determined that the girl had been strangled and shot six times in the head with a .25 caliber pistol, a weapon small enough to fit in the palm of one's hand. With limited information at their disposal, law enforcement authorities embarked on the challenging task of identifying the victim. Initially, the cause of death was not confirmed, but Comal County Justice of Peace R.G. Blanchard later clarified that the girl had succumbed to the gunshot wounds rather than the strangulation. The girl's attire was absent from the scene, leaving her with only a vibrant blouse, white socks, and her bra pulled behind her neck. Despite the initial examination indicating no signs of violation, the investigators held a different belief. They were convinced that the victim's body displayed clear indications of harassment and violation, suggesting that she may have fought fiercely for her life. One gunshot was found just above her right eye, while the other five were located behind and above her right ear. No weapons were discovered at the crime scene, leading the police to suspect that she had been murdered elsewhere and then dumped on the roadside. The Comal County Sheriff's Department made a plea for assistance in identifying the victim, but unfortunately they received no valuable information. From the very beginning of the case, the top priority was to establish the identity of the young victim. In an effort to obtain a positive identification, DNA was collected from her fingernails, and a facial sketch was created and distributed on posters throughout the city. Despite exhaustive efforts to uncover her identity, the police were met with disappointment as no one in the area or nearby recognized the girl from the posters. Moreover, her DNA sample proved futile in identifying her, as DNA testing was not widely utilized at the time, leaving her true identity unknown and intensifying the urgency of the case. It was a sorrowful outcome for the officials that she had to be laid to rest in New Braunfels Cemetery, Texas, under the name Jane Doe. According to the police's theory, the young victim was abducted and subjected to sexual assault. When she resisted, she was strangled and shot. Her lifeless body was then abandoned on Interstate 35 near New Braunfels, Texas. However, their assumption lacked concrete evidence or any substantial proof. During the years 1976 to 1981, Interstate 35 in Texas was notorious for criminal activity. The hunting ground became a haunting reminder of the heinous crimes committed by a killer or killers who targeted vulnerable hitchhikers and stranded motorists. Over the course of five years, at least 22 innocent lives were claimed, including that of a young girl whose fate was intertwined with this grim tale. Initially, suspicion fell upon a notorious serial killer named Henry Lee Lucas, who had been on the loose and accused of numerous murders during that period. 
However, it wasn't until two years later, in 1983, that Lucas was apprehended and confessed to the young girl's murder. Alongside him, another serial killer named Otis Toole also admitted to a string of killings during that dark era. While Lucas received a death sentence for a separate homicide conviction, the subsequent retraction of his confessions in 1985 left several cases, including the unidentified girls, unresolved. Despite the renewed investigations following Lucas's acquittal in 1981, the search for the truth became increasingly challenging without knowledge of the victim's identity. Years passed, and the Comal County Sheriff's Department faced a multitude of perplexing mysteries with no tangible leads to pursue. All they possessed were the victim's DNA, a photograph, and the location where she had been left to perish. Even interviews with individuals in the vicinity yielded no plausible explanations. The case grew increasingly bleak, and hope began to wane. Eventually, the investigation went cold, though it remained open. Nearly three decades later, in 2008, the Texas Rangers Unsolved Crimes Investigation Program decided to revisit the case. While reviewing missing person reports, they stumbled upon one that matched the description of the victim from the 1981 time frame. Subsequently, the Texas Rangers met with the family who had filed the missing persons report, reigniting a glimmer of hope in the pursuit of justice. Sandra de Leon, a resident of the West Avenue area in San Antonio, was the individual who filed the report. Upon seeing the victim's profile, Sandra and her family immediately recognized the 18-year-old girl as Carol, Sandra's older sister. This revelation provided the police with a renewed sense of hope. After conducting further DNA testing with the family, Carol's identity was officially confirmed. For 27 years, she had been known as Jane Doe until she was identified as Carol Joyce DeLeon in 2009. Carol was born on February 18, 1963, in Bexar County, Texas, USA, to Rodolfo de Leon and Ramona Vara. She had a younger sister named Sandra, with whom she grew up. Unfortunately, there is limited information available about her family. Carol resided in the West Avenue area of San Antonio, Texas. On May 28, 1981, she graduated from Thomas Edison High School, just a few days before her untimely demise. Following her graduation, Carol found herself with ample free time and decided it was time to embark on an independent life. She discussed her plans with her family, who supported her decision to move out and start her own life now that she had turned 18. When questioned about Carol's whereabouts on the day of the incident, her family believed she had gone out with friends to spend the evening. The family did not file a missing persons report because they assumed Carol had followed through with her plans to move out. However, after not hearing from Carol for many years, Sandra, her sister, filed the missing person report in 2007. During the investigation and interviews with individuals who knew Carol, it was discovered that she had attended a nightclub in San Antonio on June 3, 1981. No one had any sightings of Carol after that incident, leading the police to strongly believe that she had gone missing shortly after leaving the nightclub. Despite the case going cold for 26 years, from 1983 to 2009, the police department received a breakthrough in the form of new DNA testing technology in 2010. This technology provided them with an unknown DNA sample extracted from the victim's body. The question arose... Did this foreign DNA profile belong to her killer? The new DNA sample was entered into the combined DNA index system, but unfortunately no matches were found, as reported by the Texas Department of Public Safety. In an effort to gather more information, investigators shared details about the case on various websites and forums, urging anyone with knowledge to contact the Texas Rangers. A photograph of Carol and an unidentified male individual was also posted on the Texas Department of Public Safety website. Thanks to the assistance of the public, the male subject was identified and subsequently cleared as a suspect by investigators. However, his identity was never disclosed to the public. With no viable suspects, 
the progress in the investigation once again came to a standstill, and the case remained cold for the following eight years. In 2019, investigators reportedly obtained another DNA sample, which was subjected to genetic genealogy testing. This testing identified three persons of interest in 2020. Further advanced DNA testing, funded by the Department of Justice through the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Program, was conducted. As a result, two of the initially suspected individuals were cleared and eliminated from the case. Upon closer examination of the DNA evidence through standard forensic testing, investigators finally obtained a positive match. Larry Allen West, a 68-year-old individual. In November 2021, investigators conducted an interview with Larry Allen West at his workplace. According to reports, he claimed to frequent bars in the area and engage with younger women, but he denied having any knowledge about Carol or her disappearance. In March 2023, investigators concluded that Larry West's DNA was the closest match to the evidence found on De Leon's body. West willingly provided a DNA sample to aid in the investigation. During interviews with West's ex-wives, it was revealed that he had a history of violence. One of his ex-wives even recounted a disturbing incident where West allegedly assaulted and forced her into intercourse during their short-lived marriage. After three years of accusations and thorough investigations utilizing modern scientific methods, Larry West was finally apprehended by the police on June 13, 2023. He was subsequently booked into the Bexar County Jail on a $125,000 bond. However, West managed to secure his release by paying the required sum of money on Friday, January 14, 2023. It is important to note that West is scheduled to appear in court again to face murder charges. In 1998, the vibrant and caring Lisa Valdez, a software analyst from San Francisco, met a tragic end in her own home, leaving her community in shock. The horrifying discovery of her decomposed body, bearing 21 stab wounds, unveiled a brutal crime scene that haunted investigators for years. Despite the presence of crucial evidence such as DNA and fingerprints, the identity of her killer remained elusive for over a decade. It took a painstaking 13 years for justice to finally catch up with the individual responsible for her untimely demise. This chilling tale raises questions about what could have driven someone to commit such a vicious and personal attack on a woman known for her kindness and affection. Furthermore, it begs the question of how the perpetrator managed to evade justice for such a prolonged period, despite leaving behind significant evidence at the crime scene. Let us delve into the intricate details of this perplexing mystery. Lisa Christine Valdez, born on September 6, 1961, was a woman whose vibrant personality and caring nature endeared her to those around her. While little is known about her early life, at the time of the incident, she resided alone in a San Francisco condo. Her friends and loved ones often described her as a ball of energy, overflowing with kindness and affection. Little did they know that this compassionate soul would soon fall victim to a savage and senseless crime. On the evening of May 16, 1998, Lisa hosted a dinner party filled with laughter and good company. As the night drew to a close, her last guest, her mother Helen, bid her farewell and left around midnight. The following day, on May 17, concerns arose among Lisa's friends and neighbors when she failed to attend her usual Sunday dance class. Upon returning from a weekend away, one of her neighbors noticed something peculiar about his own condo door. The lock had been tampered with, the metal frame was bent, and there was a peculiar mark, possibly stained with blood, on the door. Concerned, the neighbor reported the incident to the building manager without involving the police. Little did anyone suspect, behind Lisa's closed door, a tragedy had already taken place. On May 20th, 1998, what was supposed to be a typical Wednesday morning turned into a chilling reality. Lisa Valdez's housekeeper arrived at her San Francisco condo, ready for her usual cleaning routine. However, 
When she attempted to open the door, it remained stubbornly stuck. Something heavy obstructed it from the inside. Peering through, she caught sight of what appeared to be a woman lying on the floor and heard a man's voice. Assuming she had stumbled upon a private moment, she hastily retreated. Two days later, the building manager, alerted by a strong odor, entered Lisa's unlocked condo. Inside, he discovered her decomposed body, partially clothed and bearing multiple stab wounds. It was evident that this was no accidental or natural death. Inspector Ronan Schuldis, upon arriving at the scene, was struck by the brutality of the crime. Lisa had not only been killed, but also subjected to mutilation, indicating a personal vendetta against her. Notably, Lisa's family pointed out her unusually short hair, a departure from her typically long locks. They believed the killer had taken it as a macabre trophy. Examining the crime scene, investigators observed the apartment's disarrayed yet undisturbed state. There were no signs of a robbery or struggle, and nothing appeared to be missing. The puzzle deepened. Who could harbor such violent intentions towards Lisa, and what could be the motive? The evidence suggested a deliberate attack fueled by personal animosity rather than a random act of violence. As investigators delved further into the case, they faced the daunting challenge of unraveling the enigma surrounding Lisa Valdez's tragic fate. Detectives uncovered evidence indicating a struggle had taken place. Lisa valiantly fought against her assailant, resulting in defensive wounds on her hands and blood splatters around her bed. The scene was chaotic with items like her bedsheet, pillows, and torn underwear stained with blood. Additionally, two band-aids were found in the toilet, likely discarded by the perpetrator, along with a partial fingerprint under the toilet seat. Despite exhaustive efforts to match the print to known suspects, no match was identified. Insights from neighbors further shed light on the situation. One neighbor heard a loud noise from Lisa's apartment in the early hours of May 17th, followed by slamming doors and footsteps downstairs. Another neighbor noticed a blood smear on Lisa's door, similar to one left during a nearby attempted break-in, raising suspicions. Lisa Valdez's autopsy revealed a grim reality. She had sustained 21 stab wounds across her upper body in a frenzied attack. The assailant targeted her chest, neck, jaw, and face within a short span of time, resulting in fatal injuries due to blood loss. However, due to the advanced decomposition of Lisa's body, crucial details such as the time of death and the nature of the physical assault remained unclear. With a plethora of physical evidence at the crime scene, forensic analysts faced the challenge of prioritizing items for DNA testing. Among them, the leading forensic scientist, Alan Keel, focused on pillow number 22, intrigued by its unique blood patterns suggesting multiple sources. By extracting DNA from the stains, he confirmed the presence of Lisa's DNA along with an unidentified male's, a potential breakthrough in the investigation. While analysts delved into the evidence, homicide inspectors Armand Gordon and Curtis Cashin meticulously interviewed witnesses, including guests from Lisa's final dinner party and individuals who had recent contact with her in an effort to reconstruct Lisa's final moments establish crucial timelines, and identify potential leads. As the investigation progressed, every detail unfolded like a crucial piece of a puzzle, guiding the diligent detectives closer to unraveling the perplexing mystery surrounding the brutal murder of Lisa Valdez. Inspector Cashin meticulously examined Lisa Valdez's answering machine, revealing a list of 40 recent callers. Among them was Albert Robinson, an acquaintance who had shown romantic interest in Lisa. Despite their past friendship and regular lunch or coffee meetings, Lisa did not reciprocate his feelings. However, Albert was swiftly eliminated as a suspect when his DNA did not match the evidence found at the crime scene. Another potential suspect, Albert Cato, had asked Lisa out on a date recently, but their plans fell through when Lisa stopped returning his calls, even though she had invited him to her dinner party. Albert Cato's DNA and fingerprints did not match those discovered at the scene. In total, inspectors investigated ten male suspects, collecting DNA samples and fingerprints for comparison. However, 
none of them proved to be a match for the DNA found on pillow number 22 or the latent fingerprint on the toilet seat. Anthony Quinn Hughes, another individual who had been in contact with Lisa, had made two calls to her shortly before her murder, raising suspicions. However, unlike the previous suspects, he was not initially considered a suspect in her murder. Advancements in DNA technology eventually led to a breakthrough in the case. A new testing method called short tandem repeats was utilized to retest the DNA found on pillow number 22, generating a profile that initially did not match any in the database. Then, in 2011, a significant development occurred. There was a cold hit. This term refers to when a perpetrator is unexpectedly linked to a crime scene despite not being part of the current leads in the case. Forensic experts confirmed the match between the DNA on the pillow and Anthony Quinn Hughes, whose DNA was already in the database due to unrelated charges. The investigation took a significant turn when Anthony became the primary suspect and his fingerprints were compared to the latent print found on Lisa's toilet seat. The match was unequivocal, as it belonged to the middle finger on Anthony's right hand, with identical features in crucial areas. This discovery marked a crucial moment in the case, pointing towards Anthony Quinn Hughes as the main suspect in Lisa's murder. The forensic evidence directly linked him to the crime scene, bringing investigators closer to unraveling the truth behind Lisa's tragic demise. The evidence against Anthony Quinn Hughes was compelling, leading to his arrest for Lisa's murder on September 10, 2011. During police interrogation, Anthony admitted to knowing Lisa from their teenage years, but claimed not to have had any contact with her since the late 1980s. However, when presented with the incriminating evidence, Anthony reacted violently, attempting self-harm with a pen while expressing a desire to end his life. Despite his attempts, the injuries were not fatal, and Anthony was formally charged with murder. The trial of Anthony commenced in December of 2015, with his defense arguing that his medical condition, myasthenia gravis, which caused muscle weakness diagnosed five years prior to the murder, made it impossible for him to overpower and kill Lisa. Although the condition forced him to resign from his job, proper medication could have put it into remission, allowing him to regain normal strength despite some challenges with repeated arm and hand movements. His neurologist confirmed his physical capability. The defense also contended that Anthony's shoulder injuries prevented him from carrying out the stabbing. However, despite undergoing surgery for torn rotator cuff tendons, Anthony remained physically capable of heavy lifting. Testimony from Anthony's ex-wife corroborated his myasthenia gravis diagnosis, which had also affected his employment. However, there were no recollections of any incidents in 1998 that indicated Anthony had returned home injured or later than usual. Nonetheless, the prosecution aimed to dismantle these arguments and present a different perspective on Anthony's abilities and potential involvement in Lisa's murder. Throughout Anthony's trial, he vehemently denied any contact with Lisa or entry into her condo, asserting that the DNA evidence did not prove his guilt. However, the DNA discovered on pillow number 22 contradicted his claims, providing strong evidence of his presence inside Lisa's apartment. This inconsistency undermined Anthony's credibility, as did the evidence of his calls to Lisa's phone, despite his insistence of no communication. The prosecution painted a picture of Anthony's ongoing romantic interest in Lisa, even suggesting that they had met on the weekend of her death. Witnesses from Lisa's dinner party indicated that she had plans with an unidentified date, which could have triggered Anthony's anger upon rejection, potentially leading to her murder. While the exact events of that night remain unclear, testimonies suggest a possible motive behind Anthony's actions. Ultimately, the jury found Anthony guilty of first-degree murder for Lisa's death on November 4, 2016. However, they were unable to reach a consensus on the attempted charges due to insufficient evidence. As a result, a mistrial was declared for that count, and Anthony received a reduced sentence of 16 years to life for second-degree murder in 2018. Anthony appealed against his conviction, citing a 13-year delay between the murder and his arrest, 
arguing that it violated his right to a fair trial. He claimed that prejudice had tainted the case due to the prolonged delay, challenging the validity of his conviction. Maintaining his innocence, Anthony insisted that his DNA and fingerprint found at the crime scene were either planted or mistakenly linked to him. Nevertheless, his conviction was upheld, and he was sentenced to incarceration in San Joaquin County, California. In 2024, he becomes eligible for parole, but it is hoped that justice will prevail, ensuring he remains incarcerated. Anthony's objections notwithstanding, the evidence against him and the court's ruling remains steadfast, leaving lingering uncertainties surrounding Lisa's tragic demise. The apprehension of Anthony for Lisa Valdez's murder and attempted assault brought a sense of resolution for both the Valdez family and the detectives involved. Palm Hofsass conveyed appreciation for the forensic evidence that unraveled the case after more than a decade. Despite the anguish of their bereavement, the Valdez family embraced the arrest, finding some comfort in the eventual conclusion of the investigation. While nothing can bring back their beloved, the arrest signified a step towards closure in their mourning process.